Hello, welcome to the EPG Paatshala program in linguistics. I am Pramod Pandey, Center for Linguistics, Jawaharlal Nehru University. In the present module, we begin the discussion of multilinear phonology. The <coughs> module that begins the discussion is entitled Autosegmental Phonology. So this module is actually an introduction to autosegmental phonology. Let's begin. There have been two main contributions to phonological theory in the past seven decades. One of them was the introduction of distinctive features to represent segmental speech sounds. As we have seen in great detail, how the use of distinctive features characterize in not only individual segments, but also groups of segments that were called natural classes, how the use of distinctive features could lead to simplified rules and thus simplified grammars, how rules could be used to show natural connection between uh, linguistic a process and an effect or the cause and effect, the trigger and the consequence. Distinctive features were of, have been of great value and they continue to occupy the interest of phonologists today. Not only are distinctive features found useful in phonology, but actually the idea of distinctive features has been extended to other domains as well. <coughs> now, <coughs> the second, the second uh, great contribution to phonological theory is the idea of multilinearity. What do we mean by multilinearity? <coughs> because of reference to it uh, so many times in the past modules, you will be able to, to tell what multilinearity is. Essentially, <coughs> it says that not only are phonological units arranged linearly, but they are also arranged multilinearly. In fact, multilinearity is the norm. The starting of uh, the multilinear representations of uh, in phonology was <coughs> the idea of the introduction to stress and tone. And uh, we have seen this repeatedly in the past few modules, how the attempt to <coughs> explain the phenomena of stress and tone <coughs> has shown these rules to be uh, very quite unnatural types, apart from being very complex in nature. <coughs> so the, they gave you a reason to think of some alternative to uh, account for the processes. So you take, you, you have been following the rule of the root of phonological rules, and you wonder if there is something else that seems to be looked into. That's where, that's how the <coughs> investigation into the representation of phonological form started. The multilinearity that we are talking about is of two kinds. One <coughs> we, we call constituent uh, multilinearity and the other, <coughs> the other is known as multiplanar multilinearity. What is constituent multilinearity? It's very much like the constituent structure of sentences in syntax with which you will be very familiar. What the <coughs> constituent structure multilinearity in phonology says is that there are prosodic units which <coughs> are related to each other in terms of constitute constituent structure. Now let's take a look at word, a word such as differ. The first syllable is stressed, so you say that the word differ has two parts to it, two syllables. One is D and the other is fur. Now, this was helpful. As in syntax in the 50s, 
The labeling was found to be necessary to disambiguate structures. So in phonology as well, it, <coughs> the constituent structure was <coughs> complemented with labeling. And thus, simply by showing the constituent structure of a word such as differ, you could explain why the word differ has stress on the first syllable. And this way of representing uh, sounds also helped us to see the difference between, let us say, the pair differ and defer. Now defer has uh, the second syllable stressed. There were many consequences of this way of representing sounds. We begin with trying to do away with, uh, uh, with certain diacritic features like equals, boundary, we called it. Earlier, all these Latinate prefixes were separated from the stems by means of a new kind of boundary in order to explain the difference between words such stress uh, patterns of differ and differ. But now, it could be done simply in terms of showing the constituent structure to be the same in differ and differ, but the labeling was different. Now, this way, the constituent structure a representation of words and phonological units continued. Uh, you can take a look at a sentence such as John went home. Now John went home has three degrees of stress. The strongest is on the last word and then the next is on John and the weakest stress is on went or came. Now uh, when we look at these uh, sentences like this, the difference in these degrees of stress in a structure like this can also be explicated, shown explicitly, to be on account of constituent structure, as you will see on the screen. So the way to represent it is that <coughs> the strongest syllable is a kind of a, a syllable which has two branches and the weak one has a single branch and thus this way of representing the strong and weak syllables can easily sh explicate stress in sentences or in phrases. Now there is more to, to constituent structure, multilinearity that we need to go into. <coughs> uh, take a uh, look at modules later on where we go into the details of the metrical structural analysis of words, of sentences and prosodic entities <coughs> as part of prosodic phonology. Now we move on to the other type of multilinearity with which we are concerned in this module, namely multiplanar linearity. What does this mean? What this means is that not only that you have segments organized in a li linear fashion at a certain level, but you also have more than one level of organization of phonological units. So you have the, let us say, in, in a simplified form, you have the segments organized at their level, let's say vowels, consonants at one level. Then you have a tonal tier. That was the starting point of multiplanar, multiplanar, multilinearity, as we explained in one of the past modules. So you have the tier of tone and then you have the tier of segments. What happens at one level does not affect the uh, tier at the other level. Now that's how these were called autosegmental tiers and that's how autosegmental phonology was born. The notion of autosegments, although stated in this form, appears to be new, a contribution, but the idea has been there in phonological theory, in the structural 
American approach to phonology, especially in the notion of long components by the American structurist linguist Selig Harris and the notion of these components in the British school of structural uh, linguistics led by John Firth. Now, there's a, they, they also thought of these multiple levels of uh, phonological representation. But there's a slight difference between them. The difference is that <coughs> there is no say, a systematic way in which these levels can be shown to be associated with one another. How these levels are connected and form a unified whole. What happens to these various levels at the time of the production of speech? Now, when autosegmental theory was first proposed by John Goldsmith, all these aspects of phonological representation on multilinear planes were thought of, and thus an explicit theory of autosegmental phonology was proposed. So the introduction of autosegmental phonology to phonological theory has had multiple significant consequences. One of them was that the nature of phonological rules came to be added with another kind of rule. Now, what is the standard form of phonological rule? Let's take a look at these, some of these rules on the screen. For example, we have these rules, a voiced obstruent is devoiced at the end of words. A vowel is deleted following another vowel. And the third rule, a palatal glide ya or a labial velar glide wa is inserted between any vowel and a non-low front or back vowel respectively. Now, what do we find here? If you look, take a look at this structure of these, uh, of the, phon the phonological rules <coughs> stated in the form of standard phonology. What we find is that every rule <coughs> has a phonological focus and then the focus relates to a change. There's a rewrite rule showing how the focus changes. And then there's environment, and you have been, you are given with some environments. So every rule has three parts, a focus, a change, and an environment. The environment may be either preceding environment context, or the right context, or both contexts. So every phonological rule has to, to be this. If there is no context, then you know what kind of rule it is. It is a context-free rule, normally not permitted. It's also called neutralization rule. These are of <coughs> great, uh, have had great uh, controversies, whether grammars have context-free rules or not <coughs> is something that is to be debated. By, by and large, we assume that synchronic phonological grammars don't have constituent free rules. So they're all context sensitive. <coughs> now, in addition to the three parts, there can be a fourth, fourth part of a phonological rule, namely conditions. Condition, the conditions can be of this kind. Let's say the rule applies only to words of a certain lexical category, such as nouns or verbs, or uh, it, it can apply only to native vocabulary, not to borrowed vocabulary in language in some of these of the Dravidian languages such as Malayalam for example the phonologies of native Dravidian vocabulary and of borrowed vocabulary from Sanskrit may be different so we can have a condition saying that this applies only to words of a certain origin but th this is the standard form of linear rules in standard generative phonology. Now <clears throat> autosegmental phonology has change the way in which phonological segments, phonological units <coughs> are represented. Take a look uh, on, at the screen. What do you see on the screen? You notice 
uh, two representations of two tiers. One is the tone tier, tonal tier, and the other is the <coughs> vowel tier. The vowel tier, the <coughs> tonal tier is associated with the vowel tier. One tone and then three vowels, all of them have the same tone. Now, there are two types of lines there. There is a solid line and there are these uh, dashed lines. Now, <clears throat> there is a difference between them. The solid line is underlying association in the lexical items and the dashed lines are reassociations. In addition to this, we also have a certain line with the with the cut there <coughs> equals boundary showing that the the relation between the tone and the vowel tear has been dissociated, and then the dotted line or the dashed line <coughs> shows that there is reassociation. So there are multiple things, multiple ways of showing the association between the autosegmental units of, let's say, in this case, tones and vowels. The rules of um, autosegmental phonology thus are also such that they are dependent on association lines, association rules, and <coughs> have been found to be very insightful. The <coughs> autosegmental uh, phonological approach to the explication of phenomena such as tone was such that <coughs> it was found to be applicable to many other phenomena. The logical basis was that this way of representing sounds could not be confined only to the <coughs> representation of tones. That is, it's not just the tonal changes which was found to be explicable using the autosegmental framework. If this was truly a significant way of account for account, accounting for a linguistic phenomenon, then this way should be available for other linguistic phenomena as well. And that's the logic. Slowly, autosegmental fr the f f framework came to include in it several other phenomena using the same mechanisms. So the basic mechanism of autosegmental phonology, the basic devices rather of autosegmental phonology remained constant, but they were found to apply to other phonological processes as well. The most important or rather the, uh, the first ones that came to be included within the approach of autosegmental phonology were these phenomena, spreading phenomena, such as nasalization or vowel harmony, as we will see in a following module. Now, the logic is this. The, it, was, <coughs> it came to be seen that a phenomenon such as nasalization <coughs> normally takes place in the context of a preceding or following nasal. So when we say something like not, then a is nasalized because of a na there. <coughs> now, or on, so a is nasalized because of a nasal following it. Now, <coughs> that means that the nasalization of a vowel actually is dependent on a nasal consonant. Now, suppose you assume you we take the feature out of, out of all the distinctive features and say that this feature is represented at another tier, such as plus nasal distinctive feature, and show that this plus nasal distinctive feature is solidly associated with a nasal con with a consonant. And then <coughs> we can show how the feature spreads on to the other to the vowels, neighboring vowels. This is especially helpful if the association is bidirectional or 
if the association takes place <coughs> on more than one segment in some languages it can involve semi vowels all the vowels up to quite some distance as we will see later so nasalization was something that was found to be very insightful explicable using autosegmental phonological framework and another spreading phenomena was vowel harmony just as nasalization involves spreading so vowel harmony too involves spreading it is normally found that in most languages where you have either the frontness harmony or the backness harmony or the height harmony we you we find that the uh, the uh, feature of vowel in the suffix or prefix takes the same features as of the stem and uh, so it is the stem which is shown to have a certain feature at uh, as an auto segment and that feature will now spread on can be shown with the help of dotted lines to <coughs> spread on to other neighboring segments that are relevant to vowel harmony so the vowels <coughs> now what we find is that there is <coughs> hardly any phenomenon within the within the uh, uh, area of vowel harmony which cannot be explained insightfully uh, by using autosegmental phonology the earlier treatment of vowel harmony had to be extremely <coughs> uh, shall we say ad hoc there was no no uh, way in which you could explain how is it that a change takes place or involves contexts which are far removed from the focus now <coughs> which came to question the relationship between the change and the context how long can the context be when we look at autosegmental phonological way of explaining phenomena then there is no such issue arising that the say autosegments are at different levels and they are associated within the formalism that is provided by autosegmental phonology now uh, look going by the representation of the spreading phenomena uh, you will have noticed that already there is some kind of a recognition that segments such as c's or consonants and segments such as v's or or vowels are <coughs> already independent of their the features for example plus nasal or plus high or minus back and so on and so forth which are put at different you know autosegmental levels so <coughs> now the <clears throat> this has had consequences on a new sub theory of phonology called cv phonology the cv phonological theory show, assumes that these there is an independent tier of consonants and vowels and these <clears throat> the cv tier can help explain various phenomena such as the distinction between a single vowel and a diphthong the distinction between let us say a long vowel and i or short vowel a and long vowel a or the distinction between uh, an affricate such as ch and an <coughs> a plosive such as t whereas ch has is a single consonant with two bifurcating association lines Uh, t has uh, is a single consonant with only one association line, and uh, this was also used for discussing, talking about syllable structures in different languages, what kind of onsets and what kind of codas were permitted uh, in languages in various phonologies. We have a full sum theory then of CV phonology, which was inspired by influenced by autosegmental phonology there are two further extensions of the autosegmental phonological <coughs> way of describing phenomena these <coughs> deal with 
the, the phenomenon of stress on the one hand and the phenomenon of assimilation on the other. Now, <clears throat> regarding stress, when you find that phonological entities are hierarchically ordered, such as the syllable, and then you have the word, phonological word, and the, the, sorry, the syllable, the foot, the word, etc. And then it is quite possible for us to conceive, conceive of them as independent tiers. So the <coughs> metrical uh, phonological theory that uh, began as a constituent structure theory um, in Hayes 1981 <coughs> developed into something like what is come to be called metrical grid theory. So there are <coughs> levels of different grids of syllable and foot and word and so on. And that seems to have really led to a simplification of the theoretical framework of metrical theory to the analysis of prosodic phenomena such as word stress, phrasal stress, uh, sentence stress. <coughs> the other phenomenon where, where we have had uh, a real significant change in uh, accounting for the native speaker's knowledge of them is the phenomenon of assimilation in general. That is, <coughs> the, the <coughs> segments which are neighboring can affect each other, can take features from, from each other, and either as complete, it completely or partially or in terms of a single feature, such as voice sounds become voiceless or voiceless sounds become voiced, <coughs> etc. Now, <coughs> all these, these uh, phenomena of of uh, assimilation ca has come to be seen as <coughs> explainable using the notion of autosegmental representation of distinctive features. It has come to be called feature geometry by Clemens and other associates. So feature geometry also is, depends on the autosegmental representation of segment features. Notice that in the standard generative phonology, these features are bundles <coughs> arranged, organized one after the other. In the feature geometry theory, they are represented at different, different levels and are related to each other, associated to each other. Uh, <coughs> this, this way of representing sounds provides an insightful explanation of phenomena such as assimilation among others. Now, that's about the extension of the autosegmental phonological framework to other phonological phenomena. There are issues that remain. For example, what happens? What happens to these autosegments when the, a speaker comes to pronounce utterances? Does the multilinearity stay or, or some, there is some crucial change in this? Now, so the autosegmental phonological theory has to address that question. The, uh, the theory has uh, come to propose that there is a phenomenon such as conflation, tier conflation. So all these various multiple tiers come to be conflated at a single tier. That is how the utterances, when they are produced, are produced in the dimension of time, the unidimension of time, one after another. But their explication, they are the accounting for them, uh, has to take into account the multilinearity of the organization or representation of these phenomena. We will look at the autosegmental phonological analysis of phenomena such as tone and assimilation in the ensuing uh, modules in the following modules and uh, let's hope you'll be able to do the exercises on autosomatic phonology in this module and be ready for an in-depth study of the other autosegmental phenomena. Thank you.